This year, 2014, marks the 100th anniversary of the start of the First World War. The first modern war that humankind fought and one of the bloodiest and most devastating we have fought and probably ever will. Some 10 million soldiers were killed in the span of four years. And all across Europe, empires crumbled, nations were formed and reformed, and whole villages and towns were wiped off the map. And no doubt, now that we have reached this monumental milestone, there are going to be any number of books and documentaries and exhibits forthcoming to commemorate this centennial anniversary, as dark and tragic as it is. One of the first of them is a series of photographs that was released this week, a series of photographs never before printed or published from the battlefields of World War I. They're by an unknown photographer, and the, the plates which back in that day, that's what they had, not film. The plates of these photographs were sitting undeveloped in somebody's basement. And they were discovered and they had been printed for the first time. And I saw uh, some of them this week. There was a slideshow uh, on, uh, on Yahoo uh, showing what some of these, these photographs looked like. And I was particularly moved by this one showing a crucifix of some size set up on the battlefield along the banks of the River Somme in France. And if you know anything about World War I, the very name Somme is enough to make you shudder. It was one of the bloodiest battles of this very bloody war. Between July and November of 1916, one million soldiers were killed fighting over a few hundred yards of turf. The British alone lost 60,000 men on one particularly brutal day. And so that context, along with the very stark black and white imaging of this picture makes this photograph, to my eyes at least, very powerful. Because to my eyes, this crucifix is saying so many things all at once. Certainly, like any place you would see a crucifix or a cross set up, it is commemorating the dead who were lost in that spot or at least nearby. But as I look at it and I look at the landscape and I look at the, the death that resonates from that picture, it seems to me that this cross, this crucifix is also crying out to God, crying out in grief, crying out in pain, perhaps even crying out in repentance. It's a crucifix that's been placed there by bewildered, suffering people who are crying out to their God, crying out to something, someone beyond themselves, beyond all of this death and destruction, to a Christ who himself suffered and suffered greatly. No doubt in search of solace, in search of something they can hang on to, in search of what I think most of us would characterize as hope. In the midst of all this bleakness, looking for, searching for hope, which is our subject for this morning. And I want to use this image as a gateway into our look at hope. 
We're looking at, we're in the midst of this very short sermon series, looking at faith, hope, and love. The three things that the Apostle Paul at the very end of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 said that we Christians should abide. Above all else, we should abide. Faith, hope, and love. So last week we looked at faith and we talked about a particular biblical understanding of faith that's not always obvious in the way that we use that word. And the general definition that we used for faith last week was trust. That's what the Greek word we translate as faith literally means. Trust. Faith is placing our trust in God. It's not just believing in God. It is putting our trust in in God, and this general definition is clarified by Hebrews 11, verse 1, where the writer says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So notice that hope is part of this very specific biblical definition of faith. So the two are very closely connected. But what is hope exactly? Interestingly, there does not seem to be a specific definition of hope found in Scripture, at least none that I could find. And I went looking this week. It's a term that's used very regularly by Paul and Peter and James and the other New Testament writers. But they use it always, it seems to me, in a way that assumes that the person reading or hearing is going to understand what they are talking about. And I think that's true of all of us. Hope is not a word that we use rarely. It's something that's very commonplace. And we do know something of what it is. But if someone asked you to define it, what would you say? We might go looking in the dictionary, and if we did that, we would see, depending on what dictionary you looked in, some similar but some slightly different definitions. Here are a few that I found. One dictionary said, hope is an optimistic attitude of mind based on an expectation of positive outcomes related to events and circumstances in one's life or the world at large. Another one said, a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. And finally, a third one that I looked at said, to want something to happen or be true and think that it could happen or be true. And I think all of those definitions are fine. And they accurately reflect the way that we use the word hope in contemporary English. But if you look in those same dictionaries and you look closely, you'll see another entry that, at least in the three that I looked in, was labeled archaic. And it's a very short one. Trust or reliance. Trust or reliance. And I'm not sure why this definition has fallen out of favor, but I think it's closer to what we're talking about when we look in Scripture and see how the New Testament writers use the word hope. Of course, this is a definition that prompts us to ask other questions. If we define hope as trust which, by the way, is the same way we, decide, we defined faith. If we define hope as trust, we then ask to ha- we have to ask, trust in what or in whom? If we define hope as reliance, we then have to ask, reliance on what or reliance on whom? And I think it is these deeper questions to which Scripture and the New Testament in particular point us to. 
As I have looked at all the places in the New Testament where hope occurs, it seems to me that Paul and James and Peter and the others whose writings are represented there are not so interested as much in defining what hope is, but in locating it. Locating it for us in a very specific place, in a very specific person. And that is Christ Jesus, our Lord. He is our hope. Hope for us as the people of Jesus is not a thing, it is a person. I mean, hope is the first candle we light during Advent, right? Jesus Christ is hope. He is our hope because it is through Him that we can trust and come to rely upon God. And we can come to trust and rely upon God because through Christ's story, we come to see and know a God who heals, who redeems, who is at work in this world, working to redeem not just us, but indeed all of creation. Through Christ's presence, with us, in us, around us, in one another as part of the living body of Christ, the church, we come to see and touch and even experience God's healing, redeeming work in this world. And because we can see, we can touch, we can describe this work, we can put our finger on it, we can point to it, we can trust and rely on something that is not only bigger and better than ourselves, but bigger, better, and brighter than our present circumstances might be. We can rely on God and we can trust that he is moving all of time and space and history towards something better. And that is why Revelation 21 verses 1 through 7 is such an important text for us to always keep in mind. This is what God in Christ is leading us to. See, I am making all things new, declares the risen Lord Jesus. A new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem are all in the process of being born. God is working to make his dwelling among mortals down here with us. And when he brings that work to completion and to fruition, he will wipe away every tear. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. Because the first things will have passed away. Even death will die. And that is what hope in Christ is. It is so much more than optimism or positive, wishful thinking. Optimism is about seeing the glass half full rather than half empty. Hope. Hope is about seeing potential and possibility in a pile of broken glass laying in the middle of the floor. But how do we come to develop that kind of vision? It comes from placing our trust and our reliance in God and in Christ. It is putting our trust and our reliance that we worship a God who created this world and said that it was good. That loves this world and believes it is worth saving. A God who is 
saving this world. No matter how hectic or unjust or unsettled our place in it may look at any given point in time. Because reality is so much bigger than our place in this world. Indeed, reality is much bigger than this world. And behind it, above it, beyond it, is something deeper and more powerful. And that is what I believe this crucifix in this antique photograph is pointing to and declaring against that wasteland of human wickedness. And that kind of hope may be archaic, but it is hardly obsolete. Okay, it's not God. Don't worry. World War I was supposed to be the war that ended all wars. But 100 years later, we know that's hardly been the case. There has been and still is all manner of senseless violence and death and destruction in all corners of our world with seemingly no end in sight. And that's why hope often seems like a delusion to those who do not have the eyes to see through and to see beyond what is right in front of us. It's also why, though, understanding what hope is and being able to define it as the people of Jesus is not enough. It can never be enough for us because that's not what Paul's instructions to us are. He doesn't say for us to understand hope. He doesn't say for us to be able to define hope. He says for us to abide in hope. And to abide means to comply with. It means to submit to. It literally means to dwell in. That's what an abode is. A place where you abide. So hope along with faith and along with love, if we are the people of Jesus, that should be the frame of the house in which we live. It's not something abstract that's out there or up there somewhere. It's something tangible down here. At least it should be. And that's why I think it is important for us to not only lead, not only read books, passages like the one we read from Lamentations chapter 3, but to begin to practice that ourselves. Hope does not contradict or ignore or dismiss reality. It doesn't try to whitewash it. Or try to overlook it. Hope stares reality right in the face. It names it. It deals with it. In fact, it is grounded in it. And when you read the laments and lamentations, when you read the laments and the prophets, when you read the laments and the psalms, there's nothing sugar-coated about it. They're not trying to turn away from what they see and what they experience. They're not trying to turn other people away from it. They're diving right into the middle of it. And that's how the prophets, the psalmists, the spiritual poets behind books like Lamentation come to be reminded and to experience the hope of their faith. Like the cross 
in this picture. They name it. They wade into the middle of it. And by wading out there into the middle of it, they declare what they believe. They declare their hope in the midst of it. That will not overshadow or overcome the cross of Christ. We will not let it. Abiding in hope. Abiding in hope is what brings hope to us. And it's also what brings us to hope. And not only that, it doesn't just help us to see it. It doesn't just help us remember it. It helps others to see it and feel it and experience it too. A few weeks ago, I heard a story, a very powerful story, about an officer who was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. And if you know anything about Vietnam, you know the Viet Cong were notorious for their prisoner of war camps. By all accounts, it was a brutal, even terrifying experience. But one group of soldiers in one of the camps as a way to keep their hope alive, each and every Sunday gathered for church. It wasn't just a way for them to engage their faith, to try to engage one another, but also to keep track of time and to have a sense of normalcy. And of course the Viet Cong realized how dangerous that might prove. And so they made every effort to shut it down. If they caught a group of soldiers on a Sunday morning, they were looking out for it. If they saw a group of soldiers gathered together praying, doing anything, they would rush in and they would try to identify the leader of the group, drag them out, beat them, torture them, and try to send a message, this will not happen here under our watch. But this one officer was determined, I believe, because of his deep hope that that would not deter him. And he gathered a small group of people around him, and even after the Viet Cong had squashed a number of these attempts to have a worship service, decided we are not going to let this happen. And this is how they did it. They got together on a Sunday morning and he as the ranking officer stood up and began to recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name. And as soon as the guards around got word, in they came. They jumped him, they beat him, they dragged him off. But before he was even out of the room, the next highest ranking officer stood up. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. They attacked him, they beat him, they began to drag him off. And before they were out of the room, the next highest ranking officer stood up. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And on and on it went as soon as they beat One of the men speaking, another man stood up. And if the testimony that I have heard about is true, the guards stopped because they were so overcome by what they were witnessing. And from that time on, those men got to have their worship service on Sunday mornings in that POW. That's what it means to abide in hope. 
for it to be tangible, for it to be present, for it to be visible, for it not only to uphold our spirits, but to uphold the spirits of others. It's the hope that sustained that officer and his fellow officers in that POW camp. It is the same hope that sustained Nelson Mandela in prison. It is the same hope that sustained Mother Teresa on the streets of Calcutta. It is the same hope that sustains the hopes and the dreams of the mother in the projects trying to raise her children in an environment every bit as stark and dark as the one on the battlefield of World War I. And it is the hope that sustains us wherever we are, even in the mundane existence of going to work and slogging through office politics and making our way in an economy that seems like it works for sometimes for everybody but us. It is this kind of hope that sustains us. The worst of humanity. The worst of the world is all around us. You don't have to lift up too many rocks to find the worst of what people can do and what the world can bring. But hope is the very best of God in humanity and in the world working to punch a hole in the very worst making a window where all we can see is a wall and it hope keeps kicking, punching, clawing, scratching because no matter how tiny that hole may be hope knows that behind that wall and through that hole There is light. There is the light of God. There is the light of Christ. There is the light of God's love and mercy and grace. There is the light of a God who is working to redeem all of creation and to make all things new. And one day, through that work, we're not just going to punch a hole through the wall. The wall is going to come tumbling down. Thanks be to God.